Hello, uh, welcome to the web seminar of IACP, uh, Gender Specific uh, Medicine in Cardiovascular Diseases. Um, it's a very important topic, and now the top cardiologists get together from all over the world, uh, South Africa, England, UK, uh, Argentina, and China, and Japan. So now uh, it's very important topic. We hope uh, all of you could enjoy it. Now I will hand over to uh, Professor uh, Koichi Node, a chair of this session. Uh, Professor Node, please. Yes, well, thank you very much, um, Professor Hasegawa. Uh, I'm uh, Koichi Node. Uh, I'm a professor in uh, internal medicine, cardiovascular medicine, at Saga University in Japan. Uh, so welcome to IACP and those web symposium the gender-specific medicine in cardiovascular disease. So today, uh, we have a great three speakers and uh, two panelists. Uh, so each uh, speaker has uh, 15 uh, lectures. And after that, I uh, have a, a discussion, free discussion around for uh, maybe 15 minutes. Okay, uh, so let's start. So first speaker is uh, Professor Karen uh, Sriba Andate. Uh, she is a director of Hatta Institute for Cardiovascular Research in Africa and professor at the University of Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, the title of her lecture is Heart Failure in Women. Uh, professor Karen Zibra Harley, please start. Yes, good, uh, good evening, good, good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to, to speak to you. I'm going to speak about heart failure in women, and the outline of the presentation is the difference in long-term outcome of acute heart failure according to sex, sex and geographic region globally. Then the differences, very briefly, according to sex in Africa. And then I will come to preventing and managing heart failure in peripartum women. This is a very important paper which was very recently published in the European Heart Journal who compared the data from a number of registry and evaluated the one year outcome according uh, to gender. And you can see I highlighted in red the parameters where there was a um, statistical significant difference. And in general, the women were older, there were fewer women, and there were also differences in the systolic function and in body mass index. Um, the patient women also had a higher percentage of COPD, of hypertension, but a lower percentage of coronary artery disease. There was also a statistical difference in the prevalence of acute coronary syndrome, which was more common in men, and in hypertension, which was more common in women. There was a differences in the medication which was received as discharge with fewer women receiving beta blockers and the combination of beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. So this also summarizes the discharge summary which was statistically different that women received a lower amount of medication at discharge comparing to men. However, here you can see there was no statistical difference in surviving in women versus men, and they used the great registry data and the American optimized data, despite a difference in age and presentation, different risk factor profile, and different medication received at discharge. So the take home figure just summarizes that men versus women in acute heart failure better survival despite inadequate therapy. And um, they highlight that we need more sex-specific clinical trials and also gender-specific treatment guidelines. And we need more global education how we manage women um, with acute heart failure. I just choose one other region because I'm living in South Africa. So I took data from the CSIS registry Again here, here it's interesting. You see many more, more female. If you look at the 20 to 25, uh, 29 year old, you see many more women in this age group presenting with acute heart failure. But there is a simple reason for it. They, um, because there is a high prevalence of PE part and cardiomyopathy leading to acute heart failure. If you exclude those women, this is the next figure, it's fairly similar 
distributed. Again, there was no statistical difference uh, in outcome according to gender in this African cohort with more than 1,000 patients. So outcome was similar in men versus women. I'm coming now to preventing and management heart failure in peripartum women. So how do we start? How do you risk stratify a high-risk pregnancy woman? It's important to um, know about the modified World Health Organization classification of maternal cardiovascular risk. The WHO2 maternal event rate is 5 to 10 percent. And here you see a number of conditions which are belonging or classified in this group. An example is the operated cardiac defect, most arrhythmias, mild left ventricular impairment, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, Marfan syndrome without um, aortic dilatation, repaired coarctation. So they do have a risk, but it's still relatively moderate. So under the WH group uh, three, the maternal risk is now between 20 and 27. That's substantial. One third of the women have a chance also to develop heart failure. So this is a typical mechanical valve, fontan circulation, cyanotic heart disease, or aortic valve, which is um, misdilatation. So those are women who are contraindicated to actually they should not have, have a pregnancy according to all the recommendations. However, we all know there are a number of women who still choose to have a pregnancy. They have a high chance of um, heart failure or death. So that needs to be highlighted to the women. And those are, this is important for this lecture, severe systemic left ventricular dysfunction, ejection fraction less than 30%, a higher functional class, a previous peripartum cardiomyopathy is residual in cardiac impairment, a severe mitral stenosis, severe aortic stenosis, now the Marfan syndrome with a dilated aorta, um, and then uh, non operated severe coarctation belong into this group. It's very important to avoid heart failure. So, all women with heart disease should ideally have preconception evaluation which includes advice, advice on risk prediction and contraception. So what does the physician needs to do for that? We need to take a careful history, um, family history, physical examination. Everyone should have um, an ECG, echocardiography to assess not only the left ventricular function, but also right ventricular function. Exercise has to be considered for objective assessment of the fun functional class and careful counseling, not only about the maternal risk of complication, the impact of the therapy, the risk of miscarriage, but it's also highly important to speak to women about the risk of early delivery, small focus station age children, risk of fetal congenital heart defect. Um, many women are not aware if they have substantial heart disease and they're planning a pregnancy, there is a high risk of not a good fetal outcome. And that needs to be also discussed. And there are dedicated publications on that, which, which goes into much depth into that. So how do you approach a PE part of one present with a high risk condition or a half heart failure? It's important to understand if the patient has already cardiac disease, are there any comorbid aggravating factors, and then it needs to be decided if the pregnancy is still early in case a patient is already in heart failure, is a low systolic blood pressure, and is, let's say, 12 weeks pregnant it's or 11 weeks pregnant, it's advisable to not continue with the pregnancy. However, if the patient is, for instance, already week 30, uh, you plan early delivery. So it's a gestational stage is extremely important to plan a safe pregnancy for the a woman, but also for the child. You manage according to an underlying disease to avoid heart failure and to manage heart failure. And I don't have time to go into that, but there is dedicated literature where this can be looked up. What is important, there are also general factors. So young women or older women have a higher risk in general to develop heart failure. Um, maternal education is strongly linked to poor outcome, low household income. Long distance to appropriate care is strongly correlated with poor outcome. 
maternal health factors like late presentation coming late to, uh, to medical attention. However, seek guidance. They're always important if a multidisciplinary team, their detailed guidelines on the management of heart disease in pregnancy, which are highly important to prevent heart failure. Medical management. It's very complex and it's important to define if a patient is non-pregnant, so planning pregnancy, early pregnancy, the effect on the fetus with many drugs, late pregnancy or postpartum. Uh, it's important to understand the physiology of pregnancy. It's complex and it interferes with many of the medication types. The FDA has changed their uh, recommendations. So each medication needs now um, current um, labeling on the impact on pregnancy, lactation. Uh, so the labeling has changed for the FDA. And they also published a very detailed algorithm on uh, the, the risk of all the different medications. You see also medications are contraindicated in pregnancy. Nobody can remember all that who is not regularly dealing with this patient. So it's important to look it up. What we do know now that beta blocker are safe in pregnancy. They, ha they do have a um, small impact on fetal growth, but it's minimal. It's less than 100 gram for the fetus but it seems to be really a beneficial effect in women who have a substantial cardiac disease. Very different to the ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors not only have a, an effect in the early stage of pregnancy, they have a complication risk throughout pregnancy, and they also have long lasting effect on the fetus or on the child. So it's highly important to stop ACE inhibitors whenever they're taken in pregnancy and or obviously to in preconception counseling. For my last four minutes, I want to um, highlight a specific form of um, heart failure in pregnancy or postpartum. It's peripartum cardiomyopathy. It's an idiopathic form of a cardiomyopathy, presents with heart failure towards the end of a pregnancy or the months following delivery, a diagnosis of exclusion and the left particular ejection fraction is usually below 40%. And we have um, over, over um, a decade, um, really the substantial research with collaborators in many parts of the world, but I want to highlight my German collaborators from Hanover University, understanding um, the interaction of inflammatory pathways, um, conversion of an increase in oxidative stress of a 23 kilo delta prolactin to a 16 kilo delta prolactin, which has an effect on endothelial cells and certain microRNA, inflammatory cytokines, and but one can interrupt this pathway with bromocryptin, which has now been included in the European uh, guidelines of cardiology. So in patients, this PPCM bromocryptin therapy may be considered to stop lactation, enhance LV function as a class 2BB, and also, it's important here, what I mentioned before, enforcing a WHO classification of maternal risk and discussion of use of bromocryptin in pregnancy is listed on a new concept in the 2018 um, um, guidelines. So the overall management based on the, the concept or, or, or the data we have now for treating a peripartum cardiomyopathy that the patient should receive diuretics, uh, vasodilators if needed, anticoagulation. It's very important. Pregnancy is a co-coagulant state. It extends to the six weeks postpartum. Um, oral heart failure medication postpartum, which must include beta blocker, asymptomatic, MRA after lactation, it needs to be appropriately uptitrated. And then bromocryptin, we know that 2.5 milligram daily for seven days uh, is, is sufficient for most women. Um, doubling the dose or longer treatment um, in severe cases had a slightly better outcome. Um, but yes. So in conclusion, each woman with substantial cardiac pregnancy is unique. There's always an effect on the mother and the fetus, which needs to be balanced. A multidisciplinary approach, including cardiologist, obstetrician, anesthetist, cardiac surgeon, others, uh, should be facilitated and will improve outcome. And understanding the precursors of preventing heart failure in pregnancy 
as the highest impact. Thank you very much.